Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel, and today's topic of discussion is inductive complex impedance. Our objective is to learn how to represent inductors as complex impedances for the purposes of AC circuit analysis. This lecture operates under the presumption the viewer has more than a passing familiarity with complex numbers and has watched the Capacitive Complex Impedance Lecture, available at the Big Bad Tech channel. If you haven't watched this lecture yet, or only dimly recall its contents, please take the time to do so now. You are no doubt familiar with the DC response of resistors, capacitors, and inductors. In summary, resistors follow Ohm's law, a phenomenon that relates voltage, current, and resistance. Resistors dissipate all power supplied to them in the form of heat and are not energy storage devices. Even our initial discussions of resistors and sinusoidal AC sources demonstrated that resistors consistently follow Ohm's law and voltage and current are in phase with one another. Capacitors and inductors, in contrast, are reactive elements and can momentarily store and return energy. As such, the reactive nature of these energy storage devices need to be accounted for. Recall from our discussions about the time-variant DC response of capacitors that initially uncharged capacitors experience a current spike followed by rising voltage. This behavior can be summarized as current leading voltage for capacitive elements and that the current spike occurs before rising voltage. The time constant established by the capacitive circuit under inspection determines how slow or fast this exchange of energy occurs. Similarly, recall from our discussion on the time variant DC response of inductors that inductors with no established magnetic field experience a voltage spike followed by rising current. This behavior can be summarized as current lagging voltage for inductive elements and that the current rise occurs only after the voltage spike. As with capacitors, the time constant established by the inductive circuit under inspection determines how slow or fast this exchange of energy occurs. For purposes of time variant DC analysis, we never really explored beyond these horizons. If, however, we push the boundaries into circuits incorporating sinusoidal AC sources, sources that continuously change, there is no initial nor steady state, and reactive elements like capacitors and inductors will continuously store and discharge energy on a cyclical basis. Despite this constant interchange, one truth remains constant. Current will be in phase with voltage for purely resistive elements. Current will continuously lead voltage for purely capacitive elements, and current will continuously lag voltage for inductive elements. We'll examine this phase-shifted response in greater detail in later lectures. The reactive nature of elements in AC circuit analysis are accounted for using one of two tools. One, either time-consuming calculus-based techniques, or two, simple algebraic techniques making use of complex numbers. My choice is to employ complex numbers. Bottom line up front, resistors, capacitors, and inductors can be represented as complex impedances, where impedance is a term quasi-equivalent to resistance for the purposes of DC circuit analysis only the complex nature of impedance includes time-shifted effects for purposes of AC circuit analysis. The true nature of complex impedance will only become apparent in later lectures. However, we at least need to learn to calculate complex impedance for now. Resistors, when represented as complex impedances, are elements entirely in the positive horizontal real X plane. Frequency of the AC source has no effect on the magnitude of the resistive complex impedance. As such, a resistor represented as a complex impedance can be calculated as the resistance value at an angle of zero when represented using polar format. When depicted in the impedance domain, resistors exist solely on the real horizontal x-axis proportional to the resistor's magnitude. If you wanted to represent resistive complex impedance using rectangular format, it would be proportional to R existing solely in the real horizontal x-axis plus or minus j times zero. Since we're representing the complex impedance of resistors using a complex number, note the value ZR includes an overbar, indicating this isn't just a magnitude, but also includes a direction. Capacitors, in contrast, when represented as complex impedances, are elements that exist entirely in the negative vertical imaginary y-axis. Frequency the AC source does have effect on the magnitude of capacitive impedance using the following formula. Z of C, note the overbar, equals 1 over 2 pi times the frequency in units of hertz times the capacitance in units of farads at an angle of negative 90 degrees when represented using polar format. When depicted in the impedance domain, 
Capacitors exist solely in the negative imaginary vertical y-axis proportional to 1 over 2 pi fc. Finally, inductors, when represented as complex impedances, are elements that exist entirely in the positive vertical imaginary y-axis. Frequency of the AC source does have effect on the magnitude of inductive impedance using the following formula. Z of L, note the overbar, equals 2 pi times the frequency in units of hertz times the inductance in units of Henry's at an angle of positive 90 degrees when represented using polar format. When depicted in the impedance domain, inductors exist solely in the positive imaginary vertical y-axis proportional to 2 pi FL. Today we'll examine inductive complex impedance in detail. You note the units of complex impedance, regardless of the resistive, capacitive, or inductive nature of the element in question, are always expressed in units of ohms. Only direction gives some clue as to the resistive, capacitive, or inductive characteristics. Purely resistive elements have a magnitude in units of ohms proportional to R at an angle of zero. Purely capacitive elements have a magnitude in units of ohms proportional to 1 over 2 pi fc at an angle of negative 90 degrees. Purely inductive elements have a magnitude in units of ohms proportional to 2 pi fl at an angle positive 90 degrees. Additionally, note capacitors and inductors are essentially mirror images of one another, with 180 degree differential between them, a fact we'll use to our advantage in industrial applications like power factor correction in later lectures. As an illustrated example of application of the inductive impedance formula, consider a 120 millihenry inductor subjected to sinusoidal AC with a frequency of 60 Hz. Let's calculate the complex impedance of this inductor, expressing our final answer using polar format. By all means, follow along and see if you obtain the same values I do. By the way, this isn't a polite suggestion. Pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following result. When we substitute our given values into the complex impedance formula for inductors, we arrive at an impedance value of 45.2 ohms at an angle of positive 90 degrees. When calculating inductive impedance, don't worry about the angle at first. Just calculate the magnitude using the formula 2 pi fl and stick at an angle of positive 90 degrees behind it and call it good. If we were to express this in polar format, Z of L would be equal to positive J, 45.2 ohms. Although this is kind of old fashioned and all the cool kids nowadays are using polar format, as should you if you want to stay on the cool side of history. Introductory AC circuit analysis scenarios largely involve the use of this basic impedance formula. As such, let's gain some practice using it with some basic example problems. As such, let's gain some practice using it with some example problems. First problem, what happens to the complex impedance of this 120 millihenry inductor if I double the frequency to 120 hertz? No calculations, just think about it. Does the magnitude and direction of the respective complex impedance decrease, increase, or remain the same? Take the batteries out of your scientific calculator, put it on the table, and put your hands in the air. Just look at the formula and answer the question. What happens to the complex impedance of this 120 millihenry inductor if I double the frequency to 120 hertz? Does the magnitude and direction of the complex impedance decrease, increase, or remain the same? By all means, pause the lecture and think about this, but don't you dare touch your calculator because I'm watching you. If you have the level of mathematical competency I expect you to possess, you should realize that the magnitude of the complex impedance of the inductor should increase since the complex impedance of purely inductive elements is proportional to 2 pi FL. Given frequency is double, the magnitude of inductive impedance will be twice its original value. Angle, however, will remain fixed at positive 90 degrees. If we do the calculations, we find our hypothesis to be true. Substituting in the given values at 120 Hz, we find the magnitude of the inductive complex impedance has increased to roughly 90.5 ohms. Double our earlier magnitude, yet the angle remains fixed at positive 90 degrees. Increasing frequency increased inductive complex impedance. I'll return to this point in a moment. Second question, what happens to the complex impedance of this 120 millihenry inductor if I have the original frequency down to 30 Hz? Again, no math, just think about it. Does the magnitude and direction of the inductive complex impedance decrease, increase, or remain the same? By all means, pause the lecture and think about this. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. Again, if you have the level of mathematical competency I expect you to possess, you should realize that the magnitude of the complex impedance of the inductor should decrease since the complex impedance of purely inductive elements is proportional to 2 pi FL. Given frequency has been cut in half, 
the magnitude of inductive impedance will be half its original value. Angle, however, will remain fixed at positive 90 degrees. If we do the calculations, we again find our hypothesis to be true. Substituting in the given values at 30 Hz, we find the magnitude of the inductive complex impedance has dropped to roughly 22.6 ohms, yet the angle remains fixed at positive 90 degrees. Decreasing frequency, decreased inductive complex impedance. Can you see the larger points through which I've dragged you with these two simple example problems? Increasing frequency increases the magnitude of purely inductive complex impedances, however the angle remains fixed at positive 90 degrees. In contrast, decreasing frequency decreases the magnitude of purely inductive complex impedances, however the angle remains fixed at positive 90 degrees. If we were to perform the same analysis at three times, a third, four times, a quarter, five times a fifth, and so on of our original frequency, we should arrive at some pretty self-evident results, notably what we previously observed. The magnitude of the complex impedance of inductors presents a directly proportional relationship to frequency, and that a plot of the magnitude of the inductive complex impedance linearly increases as frequency increases. The angle, in contrast, remains fixed at positive 90 degrees. These properties cannot be mistaken. If you think about this in terms of our previous experience with inductors, this makes total sense. Think about inductors at steady state DC conditions, essentially 0 Hz. What's the complex impedance of an inductor at 0 Hz? The formula makes it pretty clear that an inductor presents a low amount of impedance at lower frequencies, essentially 0 ohms of impedance at 0 Hz. Once an inductor has an established magnetic field, it ceases to influence the circuit anymore, it can be regarded as a short circuit hence the low impedance value at low frequencies. In contrast, at high frequencies, the inductor is continually subjected to changing voltage, and as such, the magnetic field builds, collapses, builds in the opposite direction, collapses, and so on. At high frequencies, the inductor presents a large impedance to continually alternating current. The larger points of this will become clearer in later lectures, especially when we examine AC Ohm's law. The intention of today's lecture is to merely gain some practice with the inductive complex impedance formula. As such, let's put your understanding of the inductive complex impedance formula to the test with the following set of example problems. By all means, pause the lecture and solve for the desired quantity. Pay attention to a couple of these. Some may require algebraic manipulation to arrive at the results you seek. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. The first handful of example problems are basic applications to the inductive complex impedance formula. For our first example problem, substituting our given values, we find a 4.7 millihenry inductor at a frequency of 400 Hz, presents an impedance of approximately 11.8 ohms at an angle of positive 90 degrees. Similarly, for our second example problem, we find a 68 millihenry inductor at 1 kHz to present an impedance of approximately 427.3 ohms at an angle of positive 90 degrees. Finally, for our third example problem, we find a 820 millihenry inductor at 250 Hz present an impedance of 1,288.8 ohms, or approximately 1.3 kilo ohms, at an angle of positive 90 degrees. The remaining two example problems necessitate a degree of mathematical competency on your part. For the fourth example problem, we're being asked to solve for the frequency at which a 560 millihenry inductor presents a 150 ohm impedance at an angle of positive 90 degrees. Given angle isn't a function of frequency, we can kind of neglect it and use the magnitude formula only. Algebraically manipulating the inductive complex impedance formula to solve for frequency, we find frequency equals the magnitude divided by 2 pi L. Substituting our given values, we find a 560 millihenry inductor achieves a complex impedance magnitude of 150 ohms at a frequency of roughly 42.6 Hz. Finally, for our fifth example problem, we're being asked to solve for the inductive value which presents a 250 ohm impedance at an angle of positive 90 degrees given a 60 Hz excitation frequency. Again, given angle is a function of frequency, we can kind of neglect it and use the magnitude formula only. Algebraically manipulating the inductive complex impedance formula to solve for inductance, we find inductance equals the magnitude divided by 2 pi f. Substituting in our given values, we find that a roughly 252 millihenry inductor would achieve a complex impedance magnitude of 250 ohms at a frequency of 60 Hz. This isn't a standard inductor value, so we'd have to choose the next closest commercially available inductor, which luckily is the 250 millihenry inductor right next door.
As an exercise to the viewer, I invite you to calculate the inductive impedance of a 250 millihenry inductor at 60 Hz. You should find that the complex impedance has a magnitude of roughly 250 ohms. All right, it's time for the bonus round. Given a 22 microfarad capacitor and a 360 millihenry inductor, at what frequency do their respective complex impedance magnitudes equal each other? Given the complex impedance of both capacitors and inductors are functions of frequency, there should be a frequency at which the magnitudes equal each other. This will take not only a synthesis of your previous understanding of capacitive complex impedance, but also a not insignificant amount of algebraic manipulation on your part. If you're up to the challenge, by all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. Again, given a 22 microfarad capacitor and a 360 millihenry inductor, at what frequency does the respective complex impedance magnitudes equal each other? Don't worry about the direction. I know a capacitor has an angle of negative 90 and an inductor has an angle of positive 90. Don't worry about this. At what frequency does the respective complex impedance magnitude equal each other? If you want a hint, here it is. Given the magnitude of capacitive complex impedance is equal to 1 over 2 pi fc, and the magnitude of inductive complex impedance is equal to 2 pi fl, and we know both the capacitance and inductance values, at what frequency will they equal each other? If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following result. Easiest way to solve for this problem is to put all your knowns on one side of the equation and all your unknowns on the other. Algebraically manipulating the equation to solve for frequency by multiplying both sides by f and placing all the unknowns on one side, we arrive at f squared equals 1 over 2 pi l times 2 pi c. Square rooting both sides, we get frequency equals 1 over 2 pi times the square root of lc. Substituting our given capacitance and inductive values, we arrive at a frequency of 56.6 Hz. As an exercise to the viewer, I invite you to calculate the capacitive and inductive impedance at 56.6 Hz. You should find that the magnitudes equal each other. There you have it. That's really all there is to be said about inductive complex impedance. For now, we'll revisit this topic in later lectures and discuss the significance of the positive 90 degree angle for inductive complex impedance when we examine AC Ohm's law. As a preview of this topic, note that current through an inductor will always lag the voltage across it. While the magnitude of inductive complex impedance accounts for the amount of current that may flow, the positive imaginary nature of inductive complex impedance accounts for this time-shifted response of current. As I said, we'll examine all this and more in later lectures. In conclusion, this lecture examined inductive complex impedance. We learned to calculate inductive complex impedance and algebraically manipulated the inductive complex impedance formula to solve for other quantities like frequency and inductance. We learned that the magnitude of inductive complex impedance decreases at low frequencies and increases at higher frequencies. However, the angle remains fixed at positive 90 degrees. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your Lazy Lab partner about this resource, and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.